Hey, if you got your Bibles, I'm going to get there later on, but I want you to be ready for it because I'm going to wrap up the whole sermon. But Luke 16, you can put a bookmark in Luke 16 if you got your Bibles. I'll jump into that in just a moment. And I do believe God has put something that is heavy on my heart to share with you guys today. And I believe God's going to move in a beautiful way. I really do. And, uh, but before I do, I have the honor to serve as the missions pastor here at Hope City and get to see all that. Come on. We, how many love your church? That we love to reach people. And I'm thankful we're part of a house that we don't just exist for Sundays, right? But Sundays launch us out to help people Monday through Saturday. And uh, every single one of you are a part of that. Whether you're serving and jumping on a missions project, whether you're, you're giving, your generosity helps fuel the mission of our church, your tithe and then your offerings over and above and all that we've done through disaster relief and days of hope. We truly are a church reaching people saying hope is here from neighborhoods to, shout it out, to nations, to nations. And I thought it would be amazing. Here we are. The first half of the year is already gone. And I want to show you where your generosity is. It okay if I just brag on you a little bit in our church? Huh. Awesome. Three people. Is it all right if I just brag on our church a little bit? I told y'all, get ready. We're going to shout a little bit today, all right? If you're an introvert, like, like, just get ready, okay? You're going to shout. All right, here we go. We'll shout for you. But uh, I want to share some things on how your generosity in our church is making an impact around the world, around the nation, and here in our city. Uh, first of all, if you didn't know, we, we partner with an incredible organization called FAM, and they have teams all over the world. But specifically, us as a church, when we give and we serve and we have teams go, the team's going to throw it up there. We are going directly into India and Pakistan. And hear this. I'm gonna, let me, it's incredible. Look at that. That's a house church. And here, let me throw these stats out here, and I want you to go crazy, all right? And, and, and listen to these stats. Because of you, since January, by partnering with FAM, Hope City, you've helped train 3,368 leaders. They've had... They've had over 1,100 water baptisms. Come on. And now this is where you need to really shout. Because of you in Pakistan and India, you have planted this year 241 local churches, house churches, preaching the gospel. Come on. Phenomenal. I want to share this with you because you maybe didn't even know that this is where your giving is going to make an impact around the world. We need to go to the places where hope rises. Amen on that? thankful for the pastors and we're thankful for our friends with famine. We got a dear friend. She's a part of the house, Gary, and has an incredible ministry in Uganda called The Vine. We, I probably got some friends who've been on a vine trip and, and uh, we actually, they're on the ground right now in Uganda. In fact, our team, they sent me some pictures the other night. Check this out. Like they're, they're holding crusades and right now, this week, this is something to celebrate. They have already served over 2,000 people with food and medical care and salvations and needs. They're empowering women. They got a school for orphans and bringing them off the street. And I love this because y'all know I'm passionate about prison ministry. They went into a prison two days ago and 37 prisoners got saved in the middle of Uganda. Come on. That's what's up? You are a big part of that. From neighborhoods to nations, and I could share multiple other things in the Philippines and different places that we are and all that God is doing. And we got friends here locally in our city, friends like Cuts for Christ, who've already cut hair with over 300 homeless friends and schools and partnering with the schools. How many know when you get a fresh cut, you just feel better? Am I right? Like when you look good, you feel good. You feel good, you live good. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like it, it feels great, and we're thankful for them and so many different things. And one of the things we're passionate about with local message is if you're new to church, you'll get to know this. And uh, if you call Hope City home, you probably already kind of know my family and our story. And a big part of our church is we love to go into the prisons around the state of Texas. Come on. How many are thankful for prison ministry? Amen. We go in with one mission. You might be in prison, but prison don't have to be in you. And I want you to know, we just got back. We had a big prison trip during Days of Hope. And also, we go in and we hold church services as a church. We take in volunteers. In fact, the team's going to throw up. Look at one of the church services we have. There's about 600 guys inside that service. And they'll keep going and, and keep flipping the pictures for me, if you don't mind. Like, you see, you see the, the service. And yeah, I don't know if y'all know who that crazy ball guy is. He used to have hair. And, uh, but anyways, that's from Days of Hope. Look at all of our amazing volunteers going in, going on mission trips to prison. We did water baptisms. Come on, somebody. Like, God, incredible. Now, here, here, let me get, 
Let me get these stats out, and then I need you to shout like crazy. This year, so far, through our prison ministry outreach as a Hope City, sending it in teams, providing church services, we have seen 19,934 prisoners, men and women, attend one of our church services. Hold on. We've seen 812 water baptisms. And here's me go crazy. We've seen this. 4,514 men and women in prison commit their life to Jesus. Come on, so I got one fired up. Come on, here we go. Come on, somebody. How many thankful? We're part of a church from streets to prisons to nations bringing the hope and the name of Jesus. Can I get a yell? You're like, who the hell? Something like, like, just let me know you're with me. It's just something to get fired up. How many, let, me, let me ask you this. How many is thankful for how good God's church is? I need you to get it fired up with me on this. How many are thankful that God's church ain't done? How many are thankful that God's church is still reaching people? Are you with me? Because I'm telling you right now, you think we, we just getting started with what God wants to do. God's church is strong. God's church is powerful. And can I tell you right now, like, I know that there's, there's things going on right now where, where we're like, there's opinions and there's attacks against Christianity and our faith and there's opinions about the local church. But can I tell you, we have 50,000 more churches than we did 30 years ago. Can I tell you, the local church is still stronger than it's ever been. We're still reaching people. Oh, come on. I need somebody to get fired up with me. God's church is still moving. God's church is still the answer for your family. God's church is still the answer for this city. God's church is still the answer for the nation and for the world. God's church ain't done, and we ain't done, Hope City, continuing to reach people. Now I need somebody to give God some praise. Come on, everybody in the room. Yeah. It feels good to be a part of a church that we don't just check in on Sundays, but we get fired up to reach and to love people. That's why we take the month of July. We call it Days of Hope. We take the entire 30 days serving our city. And look what you've done. We ain't done shouting yet. Y'all tired yet? Come on. Here we go. All righty. Look, look, look at Days of Hope stats. Come on, look. We have helped serve as a church in 30 days. 97,928 people with hot meals and waters and supplies. Here's what I love about Houston is we ace town strong. Am I right? Come on. We, like, we know how to come together. That's what I love about the churches in Houston. That's what I love about organizations in Houston and schools and working with the schools. And can I tell you this? Here's what I believe as a church, and it's the heart of our pastors, our team, and our church. We don't want to wait for the city to call us and then say, hey, we're going to be a part. We make sure we're ready so that when the city calls, we're already moving in action. And that's exactly what you've done. Look in the last 30 days, how many, is, it was up there. You have helped serve 119 churches and local schools and communities and organizations in this last 30 days. How many know that is big C kingdom church? Come on, amen all that. God is moving. Now, here's the last stat that I want to share with you that I think is pretty cool. As every single one of us know that we had two storms come through within seven weeks. Come on, anybody, anybody remember that? Anybody still got like a twitch? Like, like it's sprinkling outside this morning and you're like, oh, like, like people freaking out in Houston if there's sprinkle, you know, it's like they forget how to drive and everything. That's why I don't wear a church. That's why I don't put a church sticker on my truck. Cause if I cut you off and you driving stupid, you can't, you don't know I'm Hope City. You know what I'm saying? Like, Cause I probably have cut you off. Anybody else cut somebody off? Don't leave me hanging. Come on. Don't lie in church. Where you at? It's my people right there. But here's what I want you to see, though. It's pretty amazing. This is you. This is our church. In two disasters, look how many people we've helped serve outside of a Sunday. Can you throw that side up there? Look at this. 162,970 people you have served, come on, with hot meals and water and supplies. You, thank you. Thank you for being an answer to our city. Thank you for being in our church. Can I tell you right now, there's no better place to invest than in God's house. There's no better place to give than in God's house. There's no better place to serve than in God's house. If you want to see an outcome and a blessing from your investment or serving or anything from, I'm telling you right now, God's house is where it is. God's house is where it's at. Because how many believe in the favor of God? Come on, anybody believe? Come on. How many believe with the show of hands? Just wave me. How many believe you're blessed and highly favored? Come on, you at? Y'all got any son and daughters in the house of God? You blessed and highly favored. Somebody shout, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. 
I'm favored. I'm favored. And here's what favor does. Favor moves from house to house. There's favor in heaven. The Bible says on earth as it is in heaven. And if there's favor in heaven, then God puts his favor and blessing on God's house. You can't deny with the stat that I just showed you. How many would agree that God's favor and his blessing is on our church and on Hope City? Come on, are you with me? And here's what happens. When you go all in and you help serve God's house, this favor on this house moves to your house. Favor moves from house to house. Why? Because we simply said yes. That's what I want to talk to you about today. If you're taking notes, I'm going to shift to my message. Y'all ready? I try to get y'all warmed up a little bit, all right? Y'all good? Can I get a yeah? yeah. If you're taking notes, here's the time of my message. It's a statement we have with missions and with our church. is that your yes changes lives. Your yes changes lives lives. I like how they just made it personal right here on the front row. They said, my yes changes lives. I like that. Come on. I'm going to preach over here more. Come on. Where you at? Let's get like, let's go. Everybody, hey, everybody shout that out. Say my yes, my yes. Changes, changes lives. lives. Yes. Your yes changes lives. There's power. There's power in the yes. You didn't have to learn how to say no. You didn't have to teach your kids to say no. They just like, no. But you did have to learn to teach them how to say yes in the right moments. It's easy to say no. It's easy to be passive. It's easy to run. That's why we got a fatherless generation. It's easier to say no than it is to say yes. It's it's, it's okay. We even see it in the Bible with Adam and Eve. It was easier to run than to say yes when a challenge arises. I've learned this, that a maturity as an adult And the maturity of a believer begins to step in when I see you saying yes more than no. Because yes takes boldness. Am I right? Yes is a risk because you may not have all the answers. Do I got any people that you just love spreadsheets? Come on, where you at? Just wave. I know you in here. Yeah, there's a few of you. Okay. There's going to come a day we need you, but you know what I'm saying? Like, but you like details at the details and you will not move if you ain't got the details. But I wonder how many of you are sidelined with your no. God is just trying to get you to step out in faith to say yes, because you will never see what's on the other side of your yes if you stop being faithful. There is power in yes. Somebody shout yes. Yes. Just feels good. Think about, look at this scripture. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20 says this. For all the promises of God, not some, all the promises of God, every prayer that you have, every dream that is in your heart, everything you believe in God for, for your family, your marriage, your business, your ministry, the call on your life, all of God's promises, look at this, what does it say? They find their yes in in him. That's why it's through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. I know y'all think like we crazy up here, like shouting amen all the time and going. The reason why we shout and we get excited is because we know our yes is found in Jesus. And we didn't know Jesus and what he's done for you. If you knew all my story, I'm telling you right now, you would understand why I shout. That's why you can't ever judge somebody's praise. Because if you knew what they just came through, if God healed you from cancer, you'd be shouting. You'd be rejoicing. If God healed you from addiction, you'd be taking a lap. You would be getting fired up. How many know our yes and our joy is found in Jesus? There's a gift of saying yes. Can you imagine some heroes in the Bible? If they had said no instead of saying yes. Think about Noah. He would have never changed the legacy of his family if he said no. He would never reset the earth in God's heart. We're thankful for his his yes. Think about Abraham. What if he had said no instead of yes? Trust in the Lord that even in the wilderness, not knowing where he was going, he looked at Abraham and was like, yo, I need you to go there. He's like, where, God? It don't matter. Get on I-10 West and I'll tell you when to stop. There's so many of you in the room right now, you wouldn't even get off the ramp and pull out your driveway because you don't know your destination. 
Imagine if Abraham would have said no instead of yes, he wouldn't be the father of faith that we can lean in. That's why there's that scripture against hope, in hope, Abraham still believed because he knew there was a miracle on the other side of his yes. Come on, I'm not talking to anybody yet. Are, are you with me? Like, there's, there's something on the other side of your yes. Think about Peter. Peter, he shifted his careers from a businessman and a full-time ministry. He believed so much in the mission of God. Thank you, Jesus, for Peter, because if it wasn't for Peter, the mission of Jesus may not have happened. Through Jesus, Peter helped birth the power of the local church because, and now, we get the benefit from the blessing of what Peter helped lead and start. Thank you, Peter, for your yes. I think about David. David had an opportunity to go and serve his family. He wasn't even thought about. He had a father who didn't love him family and brothers who didn't care about him. They left him in the field while they went to battle to get all the glory. And then David didn't get caught up with bitterness. He had an opportunity to go and serve his family and through serving, doing a missions project, signing up on a team, being a greeter, serving in kids, like by serving, God gave him an opportunity to take out a giant. And in that moment, it shifted the legacy of his entire family. He became one of the greatest leaders and kings that we've ever known on this earth. Come on, how many know there's something on the other side of your yes? No gets you nowhere. Yes will get you to where God needs you and wants you to be. But here's what you got to understand is that every yes, you will have a fight to keep your faith. Every yes has a journey. Every yes has a purpose. My first thought I want you to write down is this. By your yes changes lives. Is your yes, it has a journey. Notice the sub point. They're going to throw it up there. Your yes has a journey. Notice this. What does it say? Don't hang up. Don't hang up. There's a story, you can go back and read it in Acts chapter 16. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to paraphrase it for you. In Acts chapter 16, it talks about a journey with Paul and his friend by the name of Silas. Because how many know nobody's supposed to go on a journey alone, am I right? That's why we got connect groups. That's why we got family and serve life. Don't do life alone. Find a friend who will roll with you. You know what I'm saying? Find a friend who will like punch somebody for you. You know what I'm saying? Like, you need a good friend. I will lose Jesus for 10 seconds if I got to take care of this dude acting like an idiot. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Acts 16. Acts, y'all pray for me. I'm still under construction. All right, here we go. Right. <laughs> Acts 16, though, talks about Paul and Silas. And Paul has a journey. And he doesn't have all the details for the journey. But, um, but when, when, what it talks about is that God gave Paul a vision, a vision to go to Asia. The Bible says that twice Paul was denied by the Holy Spirit to go to Asia. Can we go ahead and just agree right now? How many would agree? Sometimes a closed door is just as much of a blessing as an open door. You may not like it, but you need to get over it. That's not God saying no to you. He's just saying, hold on. There's still a promise on the other side of your yes. He said, but Paul submitted to the Holy Spirit and the Lord. The Bible says when he called him, he went and he reached all of Asia. No airplane, no, 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 uh, no car, no train, no nothing. He reached all of Asia in two and a half years. How many know when you wait on God, you get the spirit of multiplication and God can move way quicker and way farther than you? But there's this story with, with Paul and Silas that then the Lord gives him a vision to go to Asia and to go meet a man in Macedonia. And he hears a clear vision from the Lord, maybe gets a, a whisper from the Holy Spirit to say, hey, I need you to go here. This is your next step. This is your mission. This is your business. This is what I've called you to do, Paul. And Silas is going to go with you. So Paul immediately, when he gets the vision from God, he goes and he confirms it with the word of God. How many know you need to confirm? If you feel God speaking to you, and if it doesn't confirm with God's word, you might want to go revisit that in prayer, right? But he got a vision from God, he got a word from God, and then he went to the leaders of his church, and he got a blessing from the leaders. Now, if I'm Paul, and I'm sure you this way too, I am, if I got a vision from God, and I got a word from God, and I got a blessing for leadership, I know this, when I show up in Macedonia, God's going to be there. Amen. And here's what happened. He got there, and God was not there. 
Anybody ever showed up where you thought God told you to go? And you're like, Jesus, like, where in the LL Cool J are you? Like, like, am I right? It's like God is MIA. Anybody been there? Come on, just wave at me. Like, like, well, well, I thought you said to make that investment. I thought you said to buy that business. I thought you said to, to, to date that person. And God's like, uh uh-uh, uh, I ain't never said that. He's stupid. And so, like, like, are you, are you, are you with me? Like, like, you, all of a sudden, and if I'm Paul, I'm thinking, man, I got a vision, I got a word, I got a blessing. Surely God's going to show up. I did all the right things. I said yes. But he shows up to Macedonia, and the man is not there. And he's like, God, what's going on? Then Paul looks to the right, and he sees a group of ladies down by the river praying. Where's all the W collective in the house? Come on, where's the prayer, prayer words? And so Paul sees that they're praying. And I can just see Paul. Paul's a single man. He's walking down there seeing if there's any single ladies. And like, yo, he rolls up and he's like, hey, I got my book of numbers, but I ain't got yours. You know, so like, I, I know. It's cheesy. That's why Paul stayed single his whole life. I don't know, right? It's like, but if I'm Paul, come on, that's funny. Come on, I don't care who you are. If I'm Paul, I got a vision from God now. I got a word from God. I got a blessing from leadership, and I just had a Holy Ghost fire prayer meeting. I know God's about to show up. And he finished prayer, turned around, and God still wasn't there. So, man, what's going on? Then the next moment, the Bible says that after Paul left the prayer meeting, he turned and he encountered a demon-possessed person. And I could just see in this moment, we're like, Lord, like, wait. Maybe you meant no, and not yes, because I got a word, got a vision, got a blessing. I even prayed and fasted. I did everything, and now I got this demonic depression trying to come at me because we battle not against flesh and blood, right? There's spiritual warfare, and then Paul did what an evangelist does is he had freedom ministry. Come on, how many love freedom ministry in the house? Come on, where's all my freedom ministry? He had like a freedom ministry encounter. He's like laid hands, and boom, they're free. And now if I am Paul, are y'all following me right now? Your yes has a journey. If I am Paul, I got a word. I got a vision. I got a blessing. I had a Holy Ghost power. Fire came down. Prayer meeting. You know when them good prayer meetings, you know what I'm saying? Like you, you're like, you kicking. Like, hey, prayer meeting. I just had freedom ministry. Cast out a demon. I know God's going to show up now. And he didn't show up. In fact, the Bible says, and this is where you'll learn the story. The very next part of the story is that it says, Paul and Silas were thrown inside to the depths of a prison. Now do you know the story? He says they were chained. and They were bound up. And I could see Silas, his homeboy, this role with him this whole time, looking at him in the prison cell and be like, I tried to tell you that was your imagination. (laughs) That wasn't God. How many know you need that friend that's like, I'll world with you until it all goes wrong. They quick to let you know you missed it, right? (laughs) But all of a sudden they went from hearing a word from God, hearing a vision from God, a blessing, a prayer meeting, a deliverance meeting, and now they are in prison. What? God, maybe I missed you. Anybody ever felt like, God, did I miss you? You're like, do I give up now? Maybe I missed you. Or maybe God's saying, no, there's still a miracle on the other side of your yes. And here's where Paul and Silas get it. Can I tell you, all of us hit a moment where we feel emotional in prison by our pain or anxiety or depression or questioning God. We don't know how that's going to work. And we quit right there. But Paul and Silas did something different. They didn't run and quit. What does the Bible says? The Bible says that they begin to praise and they begin to worship God. And at 1159, in the midnight hour, one second left on the clock in the Super Bowl game, baby. In that moment, bottom of the ninth, about to hit a homer. In that moment, the Bible says the chains broke loose and the prison doors became an open. And in that moment is when God showed up. So I hear all the time from friends saying, Pastor, you don't understand. I've been believing God. I've got a vision. I know this, this, this. Why does God have me on hold? The best thing I say, if God's got you on hold, don't hang 
up. Because you still got a word. Come on. You still got a vision. You still got prayer. You still got a church family who loves you. You never know what's on the other side of your yes. All your promises are found in him. Your yes has a journey, but your journey is worth the wait when you got God in the middle of it. Can I get a good amen in the house? Don't give up on your dream. Don't give up on what God has in your heart to do. It's worth the wait. Is it painful? Yeah. Yeah. But pain builds strength. Pain builds endurance. You won't know you can carry the weight until you feel the weight. Your yes is a journey. Y'all still love me? Come on, everybody good? Y'all good? All right. Here's the the second thing. Here's the second thing. I'm going to move quick. Your yes, this is personal. It fuels your soul. You need to say yes to reaching people for you. Now, I know we walk around here with gas and, and uh, I mean, like going next door in Houston is like going 30 miles. Am I right? Come on. Like, like gas is everywhere. Now, I, this is why I need to show, show hands, my people. We're the people that, that whenever you get half a tank, you got to fill up on gas. Where you at? Come on. Right? Yep. Yep. Everybody look around. You need to be their friend. I'm telling you right now. You, because I don't know the rest of y'all, you definitely ain't that. Y'all freak out, right? And you're my spreadsheet people, I guarantee you, okay? It's like, now, now, where's my people at? You wait till it gets a quarter full, and then you freak out and you got to fill up. Come on, where are you at? Show of hands, every campus. Where are you? Everybody's at? Okay. Now, where are the people at? Y'all already know where I'm going. Where are the people at? You wait till that, well, you wait till that, that dial hits E, and then you go and fill up. Now, that's good. That's great. I just need to know where my people are at. When you wait till that light comes on and you know you got 22 miles left to go. Come on, where you at? Just wave at me. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I know you. I've seen you on the side of the road with me. I knew you were going to raise your hand. And the rest of y'all using Waze and on Waze says, hey, somebody stranded? And you just click yes and you just keep rolling. Like, that's messed up. You ain't no good Samaritan. He's like, yeah, they're still stranded. Hey, here's how, here's how I know to express lost and hurting people. Everybody, right now, if you get honest, you're empty at some level with something. Because if God answered all your prayers at once, you wouldn't need them. There's something that every single person in this room, every campus, every person listening right now, there is something you're holding on to, and you're waiting to see the miracle on the other side of your Yes. And also, everyone around you, your family, your neighbors, your friends, your co-workers, your employees, there's something that they're feeling empty on at a different level. And the question is, who's going to bring them the good news of hope? You can't just count on this stage to do it all. That's why we say we family. Our jobs, we pray that Sundays fill you up to go and take the good news back to where you are. And to your family, everywhere you go, so that you can remind them they may feel empty, no matter what level they're on, but with Jesus, it can fuel their soul again. Can I get a good amen on that? Do you believe that? God is such, he's such a good, good God. And here's, here's my last point to you. Here's my last point to you. Is this, is that your yes is eternal. Your yes is eternal. My skin's got a bad leak in it. Come on, sweat my here. Y'all working me. Y'all ready? Y'all ready to finish strong? Come on. Y'all with me? All right. And I told you to hold Luke chapter 16 because here's what I want to finish with. Here's what I want to finish with is I want to finish with a story, a real story in the Bible, not one that's fake. It's, this isn't a parable or analogy. This is a real story with real characters. Abraham, Lazarus, blind beggar, and another man. The reason why this story is so powerful when I say that your yes is eternal, because how many know you got to say yes for you? Yes for me. And I want to talk about something that it's not very popular to talk about, to be honest with you. 
It's not everybody cups of tea, and I may not get a whole of shouts and amens, but you can if you want. But how many believe in the Bible? Show of hands with a shout. Come on, you believe in the Bible? How many believe that God's word is true? Come on, anybody believe it? Then if you believe in the Bible, how many know the Bible says that the moment you breathe your last breath, there is a heaven and there is a hell? Just having a good heart. It's good. There's more to it than that. You can't just give God your heart. He wants your whole heart. But friends, there is a heaven and there is a hell. Did you know in the three years of the ministry of Jesus, Jesus preached on hell 33 times? Amen. Listen, most people would not want to go to his church. He preached on hell and money more than anything. Twice a month, every series, you will hear the same message. Why? Because he knows this. He knows that money will hold you back from being a giver, and God blesses givers. But then also, God knows that hell is eternal. And he came so that nobody will have to go there. Your yes is eternal. But I want you to read this story as we close. Read it with me in Luke chapter 16, verse 19. And I pray you hear the heartbeat behind it. It says in verse 19, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, and he lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side in heaven. The rich man also died and was buried. But notice the rich man did not go to heaven. It says in verse 23 that the man in hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and he saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He's in hell looking up into heaven. And so he called to him, Father Abraham, will you have pity on me? We send Lazarus just to dip the tip of his finger in water and to cool my tongue. Not a glass, just a tip. Because I am in agony in this fire, hell. Verse 25, Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime, check this out, you received good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now, he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Verse 26, and besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm that has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor anyone cross over from there to us. In other words, if you're in hell, you can't cross over to heaven, and if you're in heaven, you cannot cross over to hell. Verse 27, he answered, Notice his shift have changed. The intensity of where he is. He's panicking. And he realized he can't go there, so his perspective shifted. He answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house. I have five brothers. I have family. Warn them so they will not come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. They got church. They got Sunday mornings. They got connect groups. Let them listen to him. And he said, no, 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 Father. Maybe, okay, maybe they won't listen there. What, what if somebody were to rise from the dead, then they'll repent. Verse 31, but he said to them, if they don't listen in church. They don't listen in connect group. They don't listen to their friends. They don't listen to the Bible. They won't even be convinced if someone were to rise from the dead. Can I tell you right now, we know this. We're thankful. Somebody did defeat death, hell, and the grave. Somebody did rise from the dead, and we're thankful for that answer. But here's the sad part. You've seen the miracle. We believe in the miracle, but I'm blown away how many people don't believe there's a heaven and hell. And I know this ain't popular, but I'm I'm praying you hear the passion of Jesus behind it. Because notice this man, 
Notice his discomfort when, he, when he, he thought that he could do just a good life, but a good life is not a godly life. Just saying to, yes to good things and man, I check in and check out in church and think you can be in church and completely miss heaven. It's not about living a good life. It's about living a godly life. With your language, your lifestyle, it's not about we see you at your best on Sunday, but your family know who you really are Monday through Saturday. And this man realized he made a mistake and noticed his heart shifted. And every person is going to experience this when they get to hell, that they did not take it serious while on earth and they'll merely think about their family. He said, if I can't make it to heaven, will somebody please, somebody please go tell my family. And then he thought about, oh, my Uncle John, we get together at Thanksgiving and Christmas every year. Maybe they'll tell my family about Jesus. Maybe they'll invite them to church. Maybe, maybe they'll tell them about this place. He said, but we've been having Christmas and Thanksgiving for the last, since I was a kid, and they never said nothing to me. And then they're going to think, oh, oh, my neighbors. My neighbors, Bill and, and Karen, like, 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 I see them. for the, We've been neighbors for the last 22 years. Every morning, I see them get dressed and go to church. Maybe they'll tell my family about this place. Somebody just please go. I don't want anybody to come here and hurt like I'm hurting. And can I tell you, I think that's the passion of Jesus. Why he talked about it so much and why he says, hey, I got to go. To give them an opportunity to say yes to heaven. And everybody I've heard ask this question, why would a loving God create a place like hell? I can answer that in Matthew. It says in Matthew 25, verse 41, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you have cursed, into the eternal fire. Notice this, prepared for the devil and his, his angels. God didn't create hell for you. God created hell for the fallen angels. But Adam sinned and sin entered the world and we were born sinners and we need a savior and through Jesus he came so that you don't have to go to hell anymore by simply giving him your whole heart. You can go to heaven and you can bring your whole family with you. He came to bring good news so you can share good news. Your yes is eternal. His yes to earth is eternal. His yes to the cross is eternal. His yes is for you. Hell is a place that nobody wants to go to. The Bible describes hell in a couple of ways. Here on earth, we have two physical properties that we rely on that bring us peace. Light and solid. If I can just see a glimpse of light, if I can just get a flashlight, if I can just light a match, if I can get a little bit, then, then I feel, oh man, I got a sense of direction now. The Bible says that hell is utter darkness. You can't see nothing. And then solid. If I'm falling, I can, I can grab this podium. You, you're sitting in a chair. You find comfort by sitting in that. The Bible describes in Revelations multiple times that hell is a bottomless pit. I don't know how God did it, but you're literally suspended in there in utter darkness for eternity. Then there's two emotional properties that keep us stable. It's rest and it's hope. If you don't find rest, you go crazy. You begin to lose your mind. You have vain imaginations, the Bible says. Rest is everything, but the Bible says in Revelations 14 that torment lasts forever and ever, and there is no rest day or night. And then there's always hope in this world. Because of Jesus, we have the hope. There's a miracle on the other side of your yes. But in hell, there is no hope. Because every person in hell, 10,000 centuries later, will have not spent one less day in this place because it's eternal. Can I tell you, friends, though, the good news is this. God did not create hell for you, but he did create heaven for you. And the moment... 
You got to realize deep down on the inside of you, no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through, 98% of your heart is in your whole heart. 99% of your heart is in a whole heart. Your yes is eternal. Say yes for you. Say yes for your marriage. Say yes for your family. Say yes to bring the good news to people around you. Can I tell you, I don't know about you, but I say this is family to me. I want to party with my family in heaven. I don't want to miss nobody. I want my neighbors to come. I want my children to come. I want my family to come. I want all of you to come. It's got to resonate. I hope you hear my heart. Do you hear my heart today? I love you so much. Enough to say, if Jesus talked about this more than anything, it's exactly what we need to talk about as believers. And every day, we're going to do our best to bring the good news of Jesus. Your yes has a journey. Don't give up on God because he's never given up on you. You say yes and you begin to serve. You begin to love people. Start tithing, start giving, start going. And you watch it fuel your soul. And then your your yes is eternal. Don't play games no more. Stop clubbing. Stop drinking. Stop smoking. Stop looking at pornography. Stop everything. It ain't getting you nowhere. Give your whole heart to Jesus. Go all in. Get in the connect group. Serve on a team. And you watch. You watch God unlock favor and blessing in your house because favor moves from house to house. Every head bowed and every eye closed across all campuses. Give it a moment to just let it sink in. You hear me say this a lot at Hope City, but Jesus didn't die on the cross to be a part of your top three died to be number one in your life. You got to to let shame go away. Let pride die. At every little campus you're watching in right now, you're going to have a moment to respond. On the count of three, I'm going to ask you to shoot your hand up. To give God your whole heart. Some of you, it's for the very first time. Some of you need to rededicate your life, but don't leave here today questioning whether you're going to go to heaven or not. Your response right here, your yes is eternal. If you're watching online, you can just type Jesus in response. Let us know. You can click the salvation tab right there. And just as much as watching the Astros game throw their hands up for a home run ball, let heaven celebrate with you today. On the count of three, I want you to throw your hand up with boldness. If you're saying, I need you, Jesus, in my life, I need to give you my heart, or I need to rededicate my life, I want you to throw it up and I want you to keep it up. Hands are already going up. Ready? One, two, three. Show it up. Keep it up. Keep it up. Keep it up. Just keep it up. Yeah, come on. Just keep your hands up. Hands are going up everywhere. Come on. Katie Richmond, where you at? Woodlands, let me see you. Come on, online. Keep it up. I'm not trying to get a camera shot. I just want to see you. Come on, church. Hands are going up everywhere. I see a friend. I see a friend. I see you back there. Come on. Amen. So many hands going up. Hey, everybody shout this prayer with me. Everybody shout, Jesus. Come on, shout it louder. Jesus, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Today, Jesus, I give you my life. Wash my sins clean. Come into my heart. Today, I choose to live for you. I say yes. You can look up, friends. Can I tell you, every campus and all that. The Bible says when one comes to heaven, all of heaven throws a party. Come on, that's bigger than any Super Bowl. That's bigger than the one. Come on, we can celebrate. So many hands went up today. 